Well, I am Jim Grant, and this is uh, Grant's Interest Rate Observer of the Air, and with me today, uh, Edward Yardeni, who is a first and foremost a father of five. Uh, mm-hmm. Secondly, is the eponym proprietor and brain box of Yardeni Inc., consulting economist. And uh, but I don't know, Ed, you're a, a PhD in economics, but I think it is uh, part of the high praise I'm about to lavish on you that mm-hmm. you'd never know it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Ed. Uh, and I go back to the year uh, 18 was no, <laughs> no, it was 19 something or other. Ed got out of Cornell in 1968 and went to Yale uh, ever so briefly to attain an MA, I guess, or something like that, and then a PhD in economics under the inimitable James Tobin. And he has worked all around the place on Wall Street, not to mention the Treasury, the Fed, and the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. He jokes that he can't hold a job, but uh, <laughs> he has certainly held his clients who hold him properly. Ed, you have been the vanguard of thought on things as varied as demographics, interest rates, the Cold War, and digital technology. I've been keeping busy. So uh, yeah. I think I'll stop talking now and welcome Ed Yardeni to Grant's Interest Rate Observer of the Air. Thank you, Jim. Uh, we do have a long-standing history together. And uh, when you think about it, that's kind of an unusual part of the business we're in. We're, you know, there are very few professions where we basically go through the same up, ups and downs. Well, you, you have you have uh, had uh, so many ups. And by the way, how could I have forgotten as a sometime author myself to fail to mention that Ed Jardini is the author of Predicting the Markets, a professional autobiography, which uh, is just out, I think. Anyway, yep. Ed, so um, here we go. So um, uh, way back when, interest rates were 15% intraday, uh, right. September 30th, 1981, on the 30-year U.S. Treasury, 25 years non-call, and uh, and you were bullish on them. And uh, over the past, over the succeeding 35 years or so, interest rates went mostly down, sometimes sideways, ever so infrequently up. And in the course of that generation-length bull market and bonds, uh, stocks prospered, you prospered, your clients prospered, you were there saying the right thing almost all of the time and prescient things almost all the time. Okay, so I ask you, with those set of formidable credentials, have rates bottomed in July of 2016? Mm-hmm. Is it possible we saw a secular low in interest rates? And if so, will we, I now ask you as a movie critic, will we see that glorious movie play in reverse, the 35-year movie in reverse? Yeah, I mean, uh, the uh, our, our business really isn't that difficult, right? Things can, like bond yields can either go up, down, or sideways, so should be able to pick out... You, you think, wouldn't you? You would yeah. think, right. So uh, I think that uh, they're probably not going to go back down and retest uh, the, the lows. Um, so I'm uh, not thinking they're going to go much higher, um, though everything is relative. I'm, I'm thinking that the bond yield should be trading closer to nominal GDP. Uh, if you look at a um, chart of the year-over-year percent change in nominal GDP uh, versus the bond yield, they're always kind of in the same neighborhood, but never, very rarely identical. So that, that's, uh, so nominal GDP is, is well, four? Four and a half? Four and a half percent. Uh, All right. So, so what would four and a half percent do to earnings multiples? Well, it would bring them down. But the question is, will that bond yield go back to four and a half percent? I think the answer is going to largely depend on inflation. And I continue to believe that there are very powerful secular forces keeping a lid on inflation. So if inflation is going to stay, uh, arguably, I would argue for around two two percent, I could see the bond yield going up to three, three and a half percent. And uh, I don't know that that would uh, hurt multiples all that much quite honestly, because I think, um, you know, we've had abnormally low interest rates and normalizing them in an environment with low inflation and maybe a longer expansion could keep multiples relatively high. Ed, um, interest rates are prices. We at Grants, uh, mm-hmm. you know, are talking our book, contend they are the most sensitive sure. and important prices in capitalism. They have been under the thumb of central banks the world over. What risks lie in that fact? Well, that's a very important issue. You know, the, the bond market has been rigged on, on a global basis by the central bankers. Uh, I mean, I, I guess I was for QE1, the, uh, where the Fed bought uh, the initial slug of uh, treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. But once they got the Fed funds rate down to zero and they couldn't think of anything else to do other than buy more treasuries and uh, mortgage-backed securities, I argue that maybe they should just say, you know, we're done. We can't really do any more than lower the Fed funds rate down to zero. Uh, so I was really was not a big uh, believer that they should meddle with the bond market as much as they did. But just to, to cut to the chase, um, 
Now, the, the ultimate risk is that inflation comes back uh, just as uh, the federal deficit's about to widen because of tax cuts and uh, the Republicans and Democrats figured out the best way to keep the government open was to spend more money. At the same time that the Treasury, uh, that the Fed is on course to raise short-term rates. You know, we, we've, we've pointed out in, in grants that uh, if, you, if you take the prospective sale out of the Fed portfolio and the prospective issuance by the Treasury right. in the next fiscal year, we are issuing selling uh, from official sources, more government debt than at any time as a percentage of GDP since right. 1945. Yeah. So, uh, you know, so does that matter? For... I, think, I, I, think, I think it matters if inflation makes a comeback. I mean, okay, here's yeah. a question about yeah. inflation. Okay, so uh, uh, they don't issue a press release, preferably, right? Things sometimes yeah. just happen. So yeah. in the early 60s, inflation was running very cold, sometimes less than 1% mm -hmm. year over year on the CPI, and nobody seemed to think that was a uh, clear and present danger of the Republic as they would today. But suddenly, 1964, 65, 66, not suddenly, but uh, gradually and by degree, but seemingly at a left field, right. the inflation rate um, was not a one number, but a four number. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so if you look, what was what caused that and what might cause an unexpected uptick in inflation? Well, I now? think I think the, 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 the big surge in inflation clearly coincided with the increase in the price of oil in uh, the early 70s and in the late 70s. And back then, we also had uh, much more powerful unions that had cost of living adjustments and uh, why a worker should get compensated for their gasoline price going up from an employer's standpoint really doesn't make much sense. But if you've got a cost of living uh, adjustment in your contract, then you've got to pay th that increase. So, uh, Price shocks went right into wages, and then it just kind of became a, a spiral. And at the time, uh, in the late 70s, nobody, everybody thought that it was uh, going to be the problem f forever. And Volcker demonstrated that you could really bring it down pretty quickly if you just kind of squelched it. Uh, I think I think globalization is, is here to stay. I mean, clearly it's about to get stress tested by uh, Trump in a big way. Uh, but I think uh, there's just too much at stake here in interactions and global trade and competition. Uh, I think uh, technological disruption has never been has never occurred at a faster pace they can't quite quantify that but you know qualitatively from reading things about what happened in the past and what's happening now it seems as though technology is disrupting more business models than ever before and fundamentally deflationary and then there's aging demographics so but you're right i mean uh inflation could be the the big the inflation is the big risk if it makes a comeback then i'm gonna have to yeah. rethink my outlook for the bond market and the crb raw industrial spot index that ancient seemingly it. irrelevant right. and uh, on its face obsolete index what does it mean to you and what is it telling you? Well, I'm a, in my book, I, you know, I kind of indicate... I'm going to hold the book up to the yeah, microphone so okay. people can see this thing. That's All right. Okay. All right. Uh, in my book, I kind of go through uh, a lot of the economic indicators and try to explain what they're all about. And I did that partly for myself, just to remind myself and to catch up on things. Well, it's, a, it's a fine education in 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 uh, what matters. Yeah. Well, it's uh, it's it's what it's what I Ben Bernanke once called current analysis, as opposed to what what you learn in graduate school. But uh, the CRB raw industrials is my number one favorite. What's it, what is it doing now? Well, you know, first, like you said, it's been around forever, so it's got some funky things in it. Okay, like what's it, what is it doing? Well, it's, it's, it's going up. It's going. It's been going up ever since the beginning of so this is, 2016. This is tallow and lead and other and burlap and well, turpentine. It's, it's, also got, it's also got some stuff we understand, yeah, like right. copper and okay. lead and tin. So it's going up. Yeah. And and when does its rate of rise signify some imminent problem with inflation to you? Well, to me, it's more an indication of uh, global economic activity. That's the way I use. It, I use it more as an indicate coincident indicator of the global economy, which is strong, right? Which is strong. Yeah. Okay. So no, you mentioned current activity as yeah. as, as opposed to uh, uh, theory pro prophesizing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this podcast, Edward, was to have been held on Wednesday. Right. Uh, the uh, weather forecast was portentous. It mm -hmm. was uh, uh, threatening. It, it, right. it, there would be there would be snow, howling winds. Right. Uh, right. Uh, didn't happen. All right. Okay. So big data is now in the service of weather forecasting. I mean, how how much data could the National Weather Service, and they have trillions of sightings of stuff and wind patterns, temperature gradients, right, right. and they miss. All right, so that's weather, right? right? Weather does not watch CNBC. It doesn't have a mind of its own. It doesn't. So how is it possible these economists, not you, Edward, of course, <laughs> have the conceit to forecast economic activity, meaning human behavior, out into the distant future, like the five-year, five-year forward inflation rate? I mean, what is that about? Well, that's what I do for a living. And, um, you yeah, know, right. everyone's got to make and, a living. And, and, yeah. <laughs> That's what I do for a living. I mean, I, 
I, if, if, if I couldn't do this, I'd be a movie reviewer. All right. I... This episode of the Grants Interest Rate Observer of the Air is brought to you by our friends at Health IQ and Away Travel, and you'll be hearing a lot more about them. And no, and no ramping up the thing that chipmunks be while I read these ads because it's uh, kind of discourteous to the uh, paying advertising. So we are sponsored in part today by uh, Health IQ, an insurance company that helps health conscious people like uh, like you, like runners, cyclists, weightlifters, vegetarians, boxers, get lower rates on their life insurance. So go to healthiq.com slash grant to support the show and see if you qualify. Health IQ uses science and data, I suppose big data, to secure lower rates on life insurance for health conscious people, including, well, you know, like you, runners, uh, hard bodies, uh, people who do push us because they just feel like it, right? Just because it sense seems like the right thing to do. Well, those savings are exclusive to Health IQ. 56% of Health IQ customers save between 4% and 33% in their life insurance. And those savings, as I say, are exclusive to Health IQ. So if, uh, like saving money on your car insurance for being a good driver, Health IQ saves you money on your life insurance for living a health-conscious lifestyle. Learn more and get a free quote at healthiq.com grant. So Away Travel is uh, is helping to bring this episode of grants to your ears. They make uh, merely fabulous luggage with uh, premium German polycarbonate, unrivaled in strength and impact resistance and very lightweight. So here... Listen to that. That is one solid suitcase. So uh, you can choose from a variety of colors and four sizes, the carry-on, the bigger carry-on, the medium, or the large. That's for extended stays. When you want to see somebody, you can say, I'll, I'll stay with you for five days. But in fact, in fact, you have it in the back of your head to stay for like five months, just like Tom Paine did when he visited his friends in Europe. So it's a lifetime warranty. If anything breaks, we will fix or replace it for you for life. 100-day trial. Live with it. Vibe with it. I guess that's millennial stuff, right? Vibe with it. Travel with it. If at any point you decide it's not for you, return it for a full refund. No questions asked. Free shipping on any away order within the 48 states. Uh, Carry-on sizes that are compliant with all major U.S. airlines while maximizing the amount you can pack. So uh, it says here that uh, we're going to offer you the special offer, the unique URL Grants Pod, G-R-A-N-T-S-P-U-D. That's for $20 off a suitcase. Visit awaytravel.com slash Grants Pod and use promo code Grants Pod during checkout. Now, Edward, uh, a while ago, I think in 2003, I read in your book that uh, a certain eminent University of Chicago professor, and in fact, let's name him Robert Lucas, declared that uh, that macroeconomics has succeeded. Yep. Has macroeconomics succeeded? And if it perhaps has not, what does that say about the art of central banking? Well, uh, I think um, Janet Yale, and um, I think it was in 2016, so it was just kind of the tail end of her uh, term at, uh, at the Fed, uh, gave a speech, uh, I think it was in Boston, a conference kind of uh, re-examining macroeconomics. And it was an amazing speech because he basically said, you know, here's several questions that I have for all you macroeconomists in the room uh, that we really need to get a better handle on. And it included something like, uh, what really determines inflation? How, how do we you know, how do we actually understand inflation? Which I thought, well, I guess we haven't really made any progress as, as macroeconomists. And by the way, I studied macroeconomics from her because she took the Tobin notes six years before I got there and I studied from them. But uh, I think central bankers um, are central planners. And you know, I think you and I are probably on the same page on that one, that uh, they have this conceit that um, monetary policy can solve a lot of problems. And that certainly has been... Well, it can certainly create a lot of problems. Well, uh, they can create a lot of problems. The, the, the real issue here up, up ahead here is w whether there will actually be a price to pay for what they've been doing over the past eight, nine years. With Ten, years. Yeah. Ten years. What do, you, what do you think? Is there a price? Well, you know, I, I tell people I'm not a preacher. I don't do good or bad in terms of policy. I, I, I'm, I'm an investment strategist. I do bullish or bearish. So I would say that, you know, up until now, it's been bullish. I mean, I still think it's basically bullish. I think we've been extraordinarily, I don't know whether we've been lucky, because I don't think luck had much to do with why inflation has been kept down. But if inflation ever had come back along the way, I mean, if anybody told us that they were going to increase their balance sheets by the amounts they have over the past 10 years, most of us would have said, no way that's going to happen, because some more along the way, inflation is going to come back and they're going to have to squelch it all. But uh, they have rigged markets, they have distorted markets, and history shows that if you do that for too long, once you start to reverse course, something cracks. What are you what are you what are you doing with your money? And if I may ask, and what yeah. are you what are you telling your clients to do with theirs? Well, 
I, I don't really want to worry about my own personal portfolio at the same time as I'm giving advice about the market. So it's always been, I mean, I, I have a lot of clients that manage money, but I'm, it's actually been very passive in terms of yeah. keeping it in index funds and, uh, and uh, bonds. So um, I haven't made a lot of money. Uh, you know, I mean, I've, I've done well in my own account just with pretty much vanilla kind of investments. But I, I don't want to have a situation where the market's taken a dive and my personal circumstances are emotionally affecting my judgment about the markets. Yeah. What, in your view, as someone who has not only seen risk and understood them, but also knew which risks not to pay attention to, what is the most significant risk of financial and investment consequence that you see? Well, I think we've been um, circling it here, and that would be that uh, I could be wrong. It's happened before, and inflation makes a startling comeback. As How about as... China? How about China with showing bank assets at 51% of GDP never I, before I, seen I, or imagined? I would uh, I would put that on the list uh, maybe as number two or maybe as a contender for the number one position, because while everybody keeps focusing on the Fed, the BOJ, the ECB, the real big story has been the uh, what's going on in China and their monetary system. And I've been pointing out on a monthly basis, I said, look, uh, in 2008, uh, the Chinese banks had loans of $5 trillion. Today, they have loans of $20 trillion. So, I mean, it's just extraordinary. Now, in some ways, they remind me of Japan because, you know, everybody said, well, nobody really cares about the excesses in Japan because they owe it to themselves. And it's the same thing in China. If you look at M2, uh, their deposit growth has been in line with their bank loans. So they've been basically, they have a very high savings right there. And uh, they've been leveraging it up to the hilt to keep things growing. And they just can't figure out any other way to keep themselves growing other than continuing to base it on debt. So, But as you know, the uh, China doomsday scenario has been around for a long time. And uh, hey, so was the mortgage doomsday scenario in 2007. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, at some point, something, you know, things that are of concern could become a real serious uh, issue. What movie should we see? Uh, one. <laughs> you only got well, get, one. Get, get out. Get okay. out. Um, Edward Denny, movie critic, father of five, a scholar um, and uh, right on the money thinker about markets and uh, economics. What a pleasure to have you and congratulations on your book, Edward, Predicting the Markets, Edward Yardeni. Thank you, Jim. So that does it. That does it for today. Thank you, Edward Yardeni. Thank you for being with us. Oh, yes, we are also sponsored by uh, us. So, uh, you know, subscribe to grants, but uh, but also how about a little uh, personal interaction? Come to the conference at the Plaza Hotel on April 10th and uh, you will see a panoply of thoughtful people and hear them too and it's going to be stupendous. So April 10th at the Plaza Hotel. Uh, see you there and uh, talk to you next time on the Grants Interest Rate Observer Podcast. Mm -hmm.